Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. Today I'll share a modern look for a raised bed. Urban forester Mark Bays joins me to look back at the challenges our trees have endured this past year and what we need to be doing now to help them. We follow a textile from dirt to shirt. Finally, as we are cleaning up the garden, we talk about the versatility of compost piles. I really like different options for raised beds and in fact I kind of have a problem now because I can't help myself when I go shopping. I look at different things and I think to myself, could I turn that into a raised bed? Well there's a lot of different materials that you can use for raised beds and then I have another one here that I came across. Now this is a fire pit ring. Um, it does cost about $50 but for $50 it's really easy to install durable and low maintenance and so basically all you have to do is find a location and put this fire pit ring down and then fill it with the soil of your choice because it is a galvanized steel you've got this nice industrial look to your garden plus like i said it's low maintenance unlike wood it's not going to rot and deteriorate as fast you don't have to paint it or anything as well and the other thing that i really like about it too is if you have grass that butts up to it it's really nice to weed eat so you don't have to worry about it damaging the material either now you can see here, we just found a location next to our fence that we decided we wanted to plant some plants. And so again, like raised beds, other raised beds, you can always amend the soil however you want. So we have a blueberry in here that we made the soil a little bit lower in pH to give it that acidic climate that the blueberry likes. So now this is an example of just using one fire ring, but we took that a step further and we purchased three different fire rings. So now this is kind of a design that you could use in order to um, make a little bit bigger display. But what I like about it is it gives you that industrial look and again, it's low maintenance. So here we purchased three fire rings. So now we're at a price of about $150, but a lot of times that's the price of most of your garden kits. So what we did was we have a full size ring up here that we just placed on the surface of the soil. And then using a grinder, we went ahead and cut the other two uh, rings. And so here we have kind of an arc that fits into that full circle in the back. And then we have another arc that fits into the other two. You can see that each ring we kind of lowered. Uh, again, this one is setting on the soil surface. This one we buried a couple of inches. And then that third one we went down halfway on it. So what is nice about this is it gives you that little terraced look. Again, a contemporary look in your landscape. But a nice planting bed in each one of these, you can amend the soil differently. So you could have a blueberry up top and then you could have your regular plants down below. So yes, there are cheaper ways to make raised beds, but for a nice industrial modern look that's low maintenance for $150 getting three fire rings makes a nice terrace garden for your landscape. It's been a year since last year's ice storm and we wanted to talk with Mark Bays, our urban forester, a little bit about the recovery efforts that have been happening since last October. So Mark, yeah, it's been quite a year, right, it's for been, trees? It's, it's <laughs> been crazy to think where we were just a year ago. I mean, I was without electricity for 13 days wow. in a row and it's just amazing. You know, and, and as we look back to see how not only the ice storm, 
but also the cold weather. That's, that's the real pandemic, I think, that's been happening this year. <laughs> Yeah, so let's to kind of recap. So this time last year, yeah. year to the date almost, I mean, look at what the trees look like with right. all of these leaves on it yeah. and covered with ice. Totally covered so with ice. So let's talk a little bit about the devastation that we saw right after that. Right, so, so this tree that we're standing right next to here, it's about an eight inch caliper tree. And we've been trying to figure out just how much we've lost as a result of the ice storm. So when I talk with some of the cities that are in the central Oklahoma city area, Based on the amount of tonnage of debris that was hauled away, we lost about three million of these trees that wow. we're standing next to. Now, if you think about that, I mean, that's not really the case. That was just the debris that was taken away. Right. But think about the other debris that we still have in our natural areas, uh, in, in people's yards that they haven't even dealt with yet. So that could be as high as seven, even 10 million trees that we may have lost. Now, and that's just in the Oklahoma City area based off of the numbers that were reported. So, that's, that's only yeah. on the numbers that are reported, so it's it's much higher than that. And then again, that's also based off of just the limbs and stuff equivalent to- Equivalent to that Three size million of, of these trees. I wow, know that, that's incredible. And if you think about the benefits that we lost from that, you think about the soil protection, you think about the air quality, there's lots of human health benefits that we get from these trees. You know, if you're just interested to learn about more about how trees improve your everyday lives, you can go to this really wonderful website. It's called HealthyTreesHealthyLives.org. Okay, so we definitely know trees are important, and it wasn't just the ice storm that was so detrimental. Then we were followed up in February by this crazy deep freeze that we've yeah. never had here in Oklahoma before. Yeah, we lost so much of our thin bark trees during that time, yeah. and, and we're actually still seeing some of that damage. Uh, We've seen a lot of oak trees throughout the summer months come out fully leafed and lose all their leaves. We're seeing a lot of problems with different pine trees because they came fully leafed out. And the only common denominator is those that didn't get the ice damage, they've got the freeze damage that we're just now beginning to see. Okay. Lots of trees, like uh, some of the smaller trees, for instance, uh, uh, Vitex mm -hmm. and the crepe myrtles, we're really seeing a lot of those that, that also got damaged with that. Yeah, so obviously things are affected by their own sort of resistance, you know, how mature they were, if they were already in, in decline going into all of this, this sort of maybe took some of them out. Right. Um, at last year when we talked, we said just kind of take care of any of the widow makers, you know, the ones that were hanging. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, you know, what we need to be aware of with our trees right now. If we still have trees, um, I think the leaves are kind of hiding some of that damage, right? Am oh, I correct yeah. on this? Th that's what's going to happen. Everybody has, the leaves came out last week. Everybody went on their way. They all got happy. We forgot about how much <laughs> damage is still up in the trees. So once the leaves drop, what you're going to see is you're going to see a lot of branches that are still dead in there. Those, they're hanging. We still need to address those and those should be removed as mm -hmm. well. That's the first thing is, you know, we still saw trees branches die. So anything that's dead, go ahead and remove that. Remove those hangers, try and cut them back to the next union. You've done a lot of shows on proper pruning and everything like that. If it's too much for you, use a professional with that. The other thing that you'll probably be seeing is if you were fortunate to keep a lot of your trees there, is you'll begin to see those sprouts, water suckers. And those are those little branches that start shooting up in time. And that tree, what it's trying to do is replace all the branches that were lost. So don't take all those off at one time. There are a number of them that are growing straight up. Okay. And those straight up ones, they have a much stronger union to that branch. And so those are the ones that we're trying to protect and save. Eventually they, they may need to be removed, but right now those are the ones that we're trying to save. So there are some things that we need to be doing now uh, and in the next few years to help those trees still recover from this ice storm. And I always kind of equivalent, like, you know, the tree's trying to put up new solar panels, right? And it's ah. been devastated, yeah. so it wants to get them up there quickly. Yeah. That's why it tends to be weak and you see a lot of water sprouts. Yeah. That, but it, you can train those to be stronger if it's got a good union. Yes. Um, but what about that? We often see a lot of them come out at one junction right. together. That, so maybe those aren't the ones we would want to keep. Is well, that, let's just say you have the very tip of your branches or your, your tree was pruned back to, uh, in between a natural place. Uh -huh. 
you could possibly start seeing a hairball of mm -hmm. these sprouts coming out. It's still possible to find the stronger attachment okay. on those and still thin those out as well. Okay. So whether they're growing straight up or out of the very tip of it, there is a process. It's going to be a year, yearly process right. and it's not this year, it's not next year, it's not the year after that. It's a continual process to make the selection on those to choose the strongest ones that are attached so eventually you may only have two or three okay. that are growing out and, on that very end. And by slowly thinning off some of those water sprouts, you're going to encourage more of that energy into one or a couple yeah. to make those stronger? Is that kind of the thought yeah, so, process? So, so why you're seeing so many of those sprouts coming out right now is the tree has been damaged in other places and so it realizes it wants to replace its food source with comes through photosynthesis mm -hmm. in the leaves. So that's why it's frantically replacing everything. So if you remove all those water sprouts, you'll take away all that food production. That's why it's important to be a slow process because yeah. you're trying to allow that tree to replace the food that was lost. You just can't continually um, you know, take all those suckers off because you're continuing to take You're a, doing the same damage the ice storm did, right? There you go. Uh -huh. <laughs> Very that's right. Good. Okay. So if anybody needs to have any information at all, on what they need to do to help their trees survive from this ice storm, they can always go to our website, forestry.ok.gov. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks. So often when we think of home composting, we think of something like this. It's hidden in our back corner, but that doesn't always have to be the case. Joining us today is Joshua Campbell here at Oklahoma County Thanks. Extension Office. Hi, Joshua. Thank you so much. Yeah. I know you're like an expert on composting and you've got several examples around here at the Extension Office. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit. I think a okay. lot of people can relate about this yeah. scenario. Well, I, I don't know that I'd call myself a composting <laughs> expert, but I've done a lot of different types of composting, yeah. so I've, I've failed a lot for sure. <laughs> so let's talk through, is this working or does this not work? This is obviously one of those three bin methods. Yeah. Um, it's had a little neglect, it seems. Yeah. So this is a good example of what can happen when you neglect a compost pile, <laughs> like you said. So we had, were actively managing this right before everything shut down with COVID, and then basically it's just sat static since then. But what I like about this is it's a great example of the fact that compost happens whether we're actively managing it or not. Now, we can arguably get better compost um, by putting some systems around it and by following steps and procedures and processes, but compost is just a natural process, a natural process of decomposition. And so we've got compost happening right here, even though uh, it's, it's not pretty. Right, right. So on top, obviously, it looks like some newer stuff that's been right. added on there, but you've got plenty right. of good stuff down underneath there. Right. So, so is this kind of the best system or I know there's a lot of products for homeowners, the tumbler, you know, we've talked on our show about the keyhole garden. Let's talk through some of those different products. So what we've tried to do here, what I've tried to do here is showcase a bunch of the different options that are available to homeowners. When people think about composting, they most often picture this three bend or what we might call a New Zealand um, composting system, a, mm -hmm. a large structure in your backyard. But this isn't the best fit for everybody. Um, so we, we, we've got tumblers. Um, tumblers are a great option for folks that are in smaller spaces um, that don't want to deal with an open eyesore like this, maybe that are afraid of pest issues that can come along with composting. So tumblers can be a great option for, for that. Um, now with any composting style, there are pros and there are cons. And so I, I'm a big fan of the saying, there's a compost pile to fit everyone's style. And I truly believe that no matter um, who you are, what your circumstances are, I think there's a composting method that could fit you, um, but it's a matter of identifying what that is and, okay. and weighing the pros and cons of every kind of method. Is there, I know you work with a lot of gardeners here, is there one that's kind of preferred over others or? I don't know, I think it really comes down to individual preference. I would say the most, the one that I think people get most excited about or there, there's the most energy is vermicomposting. Okay. People using the worm bins and, and seeing the worms turn food scraps or whatever material into just beautiful black gold um, is pretty cool. So people get excited about that and kind of get the ooh factor of worms. And, and so are those kept in the garden? Let's talk a little bit about some of that. I mean, or do you keep those outside or, or in your own home? So you can do both. You can build larger worm bins that are set up outside. Now, red wigglers, which are the most commonly used worms for worm composting, 
really do have some temperature preferences and so their population may shrink and swell with weather. So in the middle of winter, they'll probably move into the interior of a pile if it's outside and you may have some population loss. Um, so there are some considerations if you wanna raise them outside, but you can do that. Most people, especially home gardeners, propagate them inside. So I actually have a number of bins in our office. I have one right underneath my desk um, that I feed lunch scraps to. And we have a few just different places around the office that we feed and, and actually use those to propagate worms all year so that we can give them to folks when we do um, build your own worm bin composting classes or when we teach our master composter class in the fall. And I know, especially inside, the biggest thing that comes to mind is the smell. But there shouldn't be a smell if you're doing it right, correct? If, that... you, if you do it right, there's minimal odor. You certainly have to be careful about not um, feeding too much and, and too much of stinky stuff. Mm -hmm. Getting a good um, layer of material over whatever you're feeding. But you're right, if you're composting uh, properly with worms, they're going to be churning through that material very quickly. And as they process it, they're going to um, really not have much odor to, to the bin. Um, there, there can be times where it gets a little too wet or a little too dry and there's a little bit of uh, manipulation that needs to happen, but for the most part, it really doesn't stink. I have, I have a bin right <laughs> under my desk and I don't ever notice it. Maybe it's nasal memory or something, but <laughs> it really, I don't get complaints from people that visit my office. So it's sort of like cooking a stew. You gotta have the right ingredients, but it, there's a little bit of give and take into what can go in there. Right. Um, also, along those lines though, there's some moisture it is sort of a reaction you're creating, an exothermic right. reaction. So let's talk a little bit about the heat, the temperature, um, and you've got another project going where you're creating heat intentionally. Right, so with a worm bin, uh, your vermicomposting, that, that's a cold composting process. Mm -hmm. So you really don't want to create heat. That's going to drive the worms okay. out. We consider that a, a, a cold process for composting. However, most composting methods, you want to generate heat if possible, um, because that's going to speed up that composting process and it's also going to eliminate weed seeds and, and disease pathogens and things that could be in the material that you started composting with. So that's, when you think about a three bin system in this kind of um, way that we're composting here, while composting is happening, the weed seeds and things that we're putting in here are gonna, are gonna carry through um, that composting material because we haven't hot composted. So right. when we hot compost, there are a lot of benefits, um, not only getting compost faster, but just some of the other um, things that you can do to harness the power of that heat with composting. Okay, okay. So what is the little project you've got going over? You did some a layer uh, composting. Mm -hmm. Talk about why you've got that covered right now. So. Again, we're trying to showcase all sorts of things that people can do in their backyard um, easily. And so this project that you're referencing is basically just a, a small little pile. We took some wood chips, we got a, a local tree service that was willing to dump a load of, of wood chips for us. And then we took some food scraps from our office and that we were able to gather and we layered the, the, food, uh, the food scraps and the wood chips, just kind of made some layering, just a small little pile. And uh, we're using the heat that radiates off of that pile to be potentially a um, just an extra space where we can warm seedlings in the winter or if we've got some uh, a flat of plants that were cool season plants that we're going to put in the ground we haven't planted yet we could utilize it as a space to protect them on really cold nights where we might have risk of a freeze okay uh, all right so, so you yeah. might be able to utilize that for some root zone heating on some right exactly and just give like some that. nice nice root zone heating exactly excellent well thanks but i know there's a lot more to talk about composting and we will be back so thank you okay. though for sharing this with us absolutely thank you That's why these all natural fibers and the natural dyes are actually sustainable for the environment. At the Last year, we partnered with OSU's Department of Design, Housing and Merchandise in order to learn more about the indigo plant and the natural dyes it produces versus synthetic dyes. Well, behind the scenes, this got us discussing additional plants and the importance that plants play in their textile industry. Recently, we paired up with the department again as they took some fashion and merchandising students down to Altus, Oklahoma to see the cotton harvest firsthand as it goes from dirt to shirt. I'm June Park. I'm an uh, associate professor in the Department of Design, Housing and Merchandising in the College of Education and Human Sciences. So this field trip uh, was made possible through the grants, curriculum grants that I and a group of our um, DHM faculty members received from Cotton Incorporated. Um, so currently 
over 200 students in our program are uh, participating in uh, one of the cotton uh, grant participating classes for this um, semester. So our program, Design Housing and Merchandising, has three different option areas apparel design, interior design, and apparel merchandising. So our students can take a variety of career paths from apparel and interior design, like a design and product development area, and retail and marketing side um, of end products, um, clothing, and uh, interior design products made of cotton fiber, obviously, and sourcing and supply chain areas as well. So we have a mix of those three different um, option uh, areas in our group. Uh, my name is Carson Scott. I'm a junior at Oklahoma State University, and I'm a fashion design major. I'm thinking right now about becoming a, a wedding dress designer, which uses a lot of synthetic materials, but it would be nice to figure out ways to incorporate natural materials like cotton into wedding dress design. I will definitely focus on sustainability and working to reduce waste and being more environmentally friendly. Sustainability is one of the things that in the cotton industry we're working very hard for. Now sustainability has a lot to do with the way cotton's grown, the really the people that handle the cotton and what it takes to get cotton to market and to the consumer. There are 17 states that grow cotton in the United States. Oklahoma is the fourth largest planter of cotton in the United States. Most of the cotton you're seeing right now is cotton that was harvested, what I'm gonna call locally, within a 50 mile radius probably, and uh, probably some of the best cotton in the world. What makes the cotton here special, some of the best in the world, is the climate, the water availability, and the farmers that grow it. This is the product that, that, that the farmer is bringing to us right now. This is what's called a module, uh, an actual round module itself. Uh, we take this product through the gin. Uh, we're extracting three main parts from it, uh, one being the lint, which is the main product uh, that uh, the farmer gets paid on. Uh, the second main product that comes out of this is the cotton seed itself, um, and then the burr, the hull, or the trash part of the of, of the module uh, that gets that gets just hauled off and disposed of. So our, all of our finished lint bales that come out of our gin go to the cotton compress, um, and then that's where it it's marketed and, and distributed from from there. Whether the farmer is in uh, the PCCA pool, or they have got outside contracts uh, for each individual bale, um, or if they're just going to sell the product on the open market themselves. Um, you know, that marketing strategy is up to them, but all the bales leave here and go to the compress. When you saw it come off the press at the gin, there was a sample pulled from each side of this bale, and then one of the, one of the cards uh, that goes with this bale, everywhere it goes, the bottom of it was put with those two samples. It goes from there to a classing office. It's a government classing office. And they will tell, tell you the, the uh, color, length of fiber, strength of fiber, uh, thickness of fiber, uh, all the things that the, the merchants want to know about that the spinners later on need. So. You take that, and that is what cotton is sold by. And it makes a big difference as to what our cotton is worth and what it's used for. To me, I'm, I'm really pleased to see the fashion students look here because these are the people that are gonna be making the call somewhere down the road as to what fabric is used in what they're producing because they will be part of the quote, dirt the shirt, uh, folks who will make the call. And we want them to see the advantage of cotton, how it's handled, the importance of it, and when that comes their time to lead that fashion team, we want them to come back and say, let's go to cotton. The coolest thing was being able to walk in the cotton fields and be able to see the cotton growing from the ground itself. Um, 
we always see uh, cotton in its final stage, but never actually see it whenever it's in the bowl. And that was such a unique experience. In the era of fast fashion and synthetic fibers, I think students might tend to think that clothing is made out of some kind of materials that can be easily manufactured. Um, so this agriculture side of um, fiber production is um, somewhat disregarded because it's kind of hard to connect our knowledge of fashion to the agriculture um, knowledge. So when they you know, come out here and see how the cotton is actually cultivated and harvested, I think they can develop more uh, new and different perspectives on fiber fashion and hopefully more sustainable fashion. There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. As we wind down another season of Oklahoma Gardening, next week we will transition from fall mums to Christmas trees. And not only will we be featuring some great plants, we will also be showcasing some special pups as well. It's a show you won't want to miss. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussion on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and Tulsa Garden Club. <laughs>